Happy Tuesday, everybody. Josh here with On The Wrong Lead, another episode of Drank and Champagne. Joined, as always, by Mr. Andrew Champagne. Champagne in Drank and Champagne, the Miller, or the, yeah, the Miller High Life of horse racing. The one funny thing that guy ever said. Hey, you know, Blind Squirrel uh, finds a nut every once in a while, but... Uh, Here, Broken Clock. Broken Clock is broken right clock. twice a day. <laughs> oh, God. Um, please, uh, uh, I apologize for the, uh, the 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 mood lighting I have going on here. Uh, I don't know what happened, but at maybe about 10 minutes before we were going to start uh, filming or recording, whatever we want to call this, um, I started playing around with the lighting uh, I have here in my room. Um, and I thought I had it in a good spot, but then like the light was just in a really annoying spot. And so I started moving stuff around. Next thing you know, uh, 15 minutes go by and I'm like, we should probably start recording. Uh, and this is about as good as we can get. I can get it right now. Um, at some point I, I will get this fixed. Um, I, I think we, I think it's just time for, uh, for a little, a little, uh, equipment investment once again. So, um, and you do want to help us invest uh, in additional equipment uh am wager obviously has a sign up code i believe it's a 150 dollar match on a 150 dollar deposit i think you just got to bet through 150 dollars and you'll get that within a couple of days uh and obviously it helps us out um you know uh they uh you know they it doesn't doesn't hurt you at all and one of the biggest things that we always say is you know, collect all the deposit bonuses you can get, and I think that might be something we talk about too, Andrew, uh, with uh, with another topic that we're going to be talking about with uh, with sports betting um, th- this weekend. Uh, but horse racing, sports betting, whatever it is, collect as many deposit bonuses as you can, because especially if you're just starting out and learning, it's better to learn on other people's money than your own. That's for sure. If it's free, it's for me and it should be for you too, at the very <laughs> least, as far as sign up bonuses for race books and sports books are concerned. Uh, we've got a pretty big show for you tonight. We're going to talk a little bit more about my upcoming trip to Las Vegas, a couple of cool things that I've got in the works. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit of the Louisiana Derby. Hey, dude, I meant to hit this button and I hit the loser button on accident. Sorry. Okay. Well, that's not an omen or anything, you know, (laughs) 48 hours, I'm going to be playing blackjack at the Orleans. I'll be sitting with 20. The dealer will have 16 and all of a sudden the dealer will pull a five and I'll be hosed (laughs) and it will be all your fault. It's good to have somebody to blame as a side note. Yes, that's a good one too, but Good show for you tonight. We've got some Vegas stuff. We've got some Louisiana Derby stuff where I like an eight to one shot as my top pick. And it's not the eight to one shot that I talked myself into last time out when that horse ran, though I do like that one just a little bit. And we've got some other fun off the wall stuff. Josh, I have a burning question to ask you. Okay, what is it? Three weeks away from one of the biggest holidays on the entire calendar. Three weeks away from April 8th, which is, of course, the first annual Lord Miles Day. And I'm just going to throw this out there to everybody. Um, I've got an Amazon list somewhere out there as far as, you know, any if anybody wants to shower me with any gifts on the one year anniversary of that. Or if you'd like to give any money to any favorite charities, that's probably also a good thing. Something designated, you know, 59 to one or something like that, because as you may or may not know, I had Lord Miles at 59 to one in the Wood Memorial. Thank you. And yes, I did bring all of this back around just as a way to make Josh hate life just a little bit more this evening. Thank you. I think, uh, I, FYI, I think I just completed the cycle. I believe that was, uh, I think that was all of the sounds on my soundboard. Um, so I will uh, give myself a little round of applause there. There you uh, go. As I you feel sh- like I haven't used it enough. I haven't used it if enough you lately. Have it's a been. Soundboard, and you're not using it to give yourself applause. What are you even doing? Exactly. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited to hear about your, your Vegas trip. Obviously, uh, I was supposed to be there this week, uh, with Mark, uh, 
stuff came up. I had I had to cancel. Uh, I was actually originally supposed to go for uh, March Madness, and I ended up realizing, and it was funny because my wife also didn't realize it, but uh, I had booked a trip on our wedding anniversary. Oh! Um, and uh, like a week or so after I booked it, she's like, I was wondering why those dates sounded so familiar. That's our anniversary. And I was like, oh, you know, because I'm just thinking about, hey, I want to go for March Madness this year. I'm just going to book it. I'm going to book it. And so I booked it, you know, months ago. And um, it was really funny because then, like, where, where it really kind of was funny is I think the same day, right before my wife had reminded me it was our anniversary, um, I Jeff Ruby Stakes is this weekend. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of my friends love them some Turfway. And so uh, I have a group of guys I know are going down the Turfway for Jeff Ruby Day. And I was like, hey, I was going to be in Vegas, but I'm not. I'm in. And then literally day after I said I'm in, I'm like, guys, I'm out. <laughs> uh, and they're like, what happened? I'm like, it's my anniversary. Um, but funny enough, uh, so... If you don't already know or can't realize it, my wife and I are both, uh, we celebrate our anniversary, but for those of you guys who don't know, uh, my wife and I, we got legally married in March. Um, this is going to be nine years this year. Congratulations. Thank you. And then we had our, uh, we had, I guess, our, an actual, like, like bigger ceremony and stuff like that. See, it's tough to call it an actual wedding because there are certain people that couldn't make it to our wedding in Mexico that made it to this one. And there are people who couldn't make it to the one that we had locally that made it to Mexico. So it, it means to, to, it's funny because my, my wife and I always say like, you know, depending on who you ask in my family, when our wedding anniversary is, they'll give you a different answer. Right. Whereas my family was more, well, you know, we got married here legally because it's just easier uh, when you do the destination thing to already have your piece of paper done uh, here. And then you just have the ceremony down there. Um, but they, um, like my family would be like, oh, yeah, well, well you got married in, in Cancun. Like that was where everything was. Um, whereas like my wife's family who was here locally they're like, no, you guys, we were at your wedding, right? Your wedding was the one that you had at your house. Like, so, um, but needless to say, uh, we celebrate both of them as in we each buy each other a, a gift or two or of some sort. Um, and we'll usually go out to dinner or do something, but we're not like big dates people, you know, like our birthday, like we don't make a big deal of our birthdays or any, like, you know, maybe the landmark ones. Uh, my, my wife brought me to Vegas for the first time when I turned 30. Uh, it was the first time I'd ever been to Vegas. Uh, so if you guys, if you guys hear me talk about Vegas all the time, it's only been seven years going on eight this year that I've, uh, I've been going to Vegas. Uh, well, it's but, also only been like five minutes since you've become a horse racing fan. Any sort that's of true. history there is six to five in Pickham. So really anything before the mid 2010s is, is a no go for you for exactly. any number of different things. Although I will say point of order mm -hmm. in theory, couldn't you and your wife have agreed to celebrate your anniversary on the later date, thereby freeing you up for either some Vegas fun or, or some fun with polytrack. I mean, honestly, I, I think in the end, like it would have been okay. But I, I, because we laughed about it, right? Like this wasn't, there was no like maliciousness. Like I can't believe you forgot because she had also forgotten. Uh, but oh, no. um, you, you better hope she's not listening to this show, man. I speak from experience on that. She, she will tell me tomorrow morning when I, because she'll probably be in uh, asleep by the time we're done recording this. But she'll be like, hey, I heard you talking about me in the next room. Uh, she, she'll always bring something up or she's like, who's Andrew? Um, that, that's her favorite one. Uh, and, uh, but Andrew's yeah. the annoying guy that won't shut up about a random race from April, 2023. Hey, my, you know, I, I still bring up the black cat incident with, uh, with, uh, maximum security. So there you go. Um, but, uh, yeah. So, um, I was supposed to, like I said, I changed my, my Vegas dates. I was supposed to go uh, last week. Couldn't because of uh, just some, 
I got some personal stuff kind of going on. Um, nothing, nothing major or anything, but um, just just had had to cancel the trip. Um, but yeah, so I think I, I actually I had all these days off. So I, I I took Thursday and Friday off still and just kind of hung out at home. But I was supposed to take Wednesday and Monday off, and I just parlayed those to this week. So there I'm off go. Thursday. I'm off Thursday, Friday this week, and I believe I'm going to go see our mutual friend Ryan Dickey nice. up at his uh, his sports book. Uh, I will be sure to make life as inconvenient as possible for him. I'm one of the, probably the busiest days he's going to have up there. There you um, go. Just do do yourself a favor if you want to really be in his good graces. Bring batteries for the remote control that he uses. Oh, I will. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll give him. I'll get him a big Just old thing of double throw A's. The batteries at him. Give them to him like a <laughs> civil person. Because if you start throwing batteries, that's going to spark people throwing a whole bunch of other things. And then I'll have to see everything on the news, and I'll be like, "Yep, that's my podcast co-host. Can't bail yep. him out." There you go. He's got to learn a lesson. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you got your you got your big trip coming up. Um, and you got, uh, I, I don't know, you, you like, you teased me before we even got in. It's like, I, I can't wait to tell you something. And I was like, oh, what is that? And you're like, you're so the main thing air. was the Lord Miles Day shtick, just because I eyeballed the picture and went, how am I going to work this into the show? So I wound up doing it that way. But as a cheap plug of sorts, the company that I work for is called Rake Tech, and among their properties is a website called Winners and Winers. I've worked for a couple of uh, their properties and done a couple of articles, and Winners and Winers is one of the big ones that I do a lot of SEO work for. And Josh, you're going to need to be concerned about a group of people because they've given me access to both their Twitter and their YouTube channel. And Goodness I'm gracious. going to be creating some content for them from assorted areas in Las Vegas during the first week of the NCAA basketball tournament. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Not going to go overly crazy with stuff. Don't be expecting picks and analysis for everything, but a lot of man on the street type stuff. If there's a buzzer beater with a massive reaction, I'll be able to take some video of it. And it'll be a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to this for a bunch of different reasons. My dad's already there. He landed yesterday on Sunday. We're recording this Monday night. He's already there. He had a pretty good day on Monday based on everything he's been telling me. So really looking forward to getting a chance to see him. I'm in on Wednesday night, Thursday and Friday, of course, the two days where it's just wall-to-wall basketball action with four games going on at once, and it's absolutely wonderful. Saturday and Sunday, still busy, but we've got some stuff planned. On Sunday, we're trying a new-to-us Italian restaurant that uh, we found. We're both very excited about that. Monday, we're making our semi-annual post pilgrimage to the Bacchanal Buffet at Caesars, but we're doing nice. that on a Monday for lunch because the crowds have just gotten way too out of control and there is no line in Las Vegas that's worth standing in for an hour and a half when you could be doing something else. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping that that mitigates that and allows us to actually enjoy ourselves at what used to be one of the best buffets anywhere in the world. It's still excellent, but an hour and a half wait needing to get a reservation that only guarantees you a spot in line. It's freaking bonkers, man. So yeah. if you're going to Vegas and you want to experience that buffet, you should, but do it for lunch, not for dinner. The food disparity is not going to be that bad. The price disparity will be significant enough. And you may be, may be able to move around. Yeah. I've been to Bacchanal once, I believe. It's so um, good. It's really yeah. good. We went for brunch on like a Saturday. Um, we had we we got a Groupon because they couldn't get people in there that it was on Groupon. Now, mind you, at that point, you know, we had uh, every property had a buffet. Where now it's down to like three or four. It's uh, not many. Ones. That's yeah. for sure. But um, yeah, it, it's great. Um, I, I've I've eaten there once. I've eaten at. Uh, Cosmo once I've eaten at the win once now, mind you, the win I ate at during COVID when they were doing, basically you ordered off a menu and they brought it out to you. Yeah. So I don't know if it was the same. It was very good. Don't get me wrong. It was very good, but I still think Bacchanal out of all of those, or yeah, was, was the best. Um, I will say, 
very sad that this no longer exists, but the kind of hidden gem in uh, in buffets was the Aria buffet because there was a Facebook game called My Vegas that you could play. And it was not very hard to get a free buffet playing this Facebook game. And my so my wife, when she found out that you could get free stuff for this, just started playing this stuff and racking up coupon, like basically like comps. And so we would go, it, it got to the point where like, I think MGM realized that people had figured out the game and like were able to like just get all this stuff for free. So like as time went on, stuff got worse and worse and worse, harder to get stuff. But the one thing that was always constant is the Aria buffet. And so we were always able to get, you know, one or two of our, our buffets comped. And then, you know, we would just pay for the drink package, which, which I think was like 20 bucks, you know? And so it was like, I mean, all you can drink mimosas for twenty bucks, and and you got a buffet for free with it. You know, it was it was great, um, and uh, sadly that's been closed and, and turned into a food court. Um, that's okay, but I'll tell you, man, the pricing is starting to get really outrageous. Um, there is a a vlogger that uh, my wife uh, watched, and I for life of me I don't remember her name. Uh, she used to be she used to work on BuzzFeed. Uh, which basically like everybody on YouTube now used to work for BuzzFeed. Um, but uh, she used to work for, for BuzzFeed and then um, went on her own and started doing like travel vlogs. And they like stayed like 10 nights in Vegas, uh, her and, and I think it was her boyfriend or husband. And they did a bunch of videos there. But uh, they did stuff like they went to like a bunch of celebrity chefs. They went to a bunch. Of, they stayed like a night in every single hotel. Like they did all kinds of like crazy stuff like that. So that's a lot of trucking your luggage from one place to another. Yeah, I I will have to. I'll I'll get I'll get the name of it. I it was it was a fun watch. Uh, for like you know if you just like need something on the background and you know I I it wasn't like overly hokey or overly like um uh like pot like you know how like some people are just like you can tell they're on the take because they're just a little too nice about everything yeah. um it, they, they they seem sincere right it, it was good um but at one point in their trip they went to uh johnny rockets which oh, is you told me about this yeah where it's yeah. Just an absurd bill yeah they go to johnny rockets i think they got like uh shakes fries and burgers like they got they got two burgers, two fries, two shakes, and it was sixty dollars. Yeah. They then went to Gordon Ramsay's burger, which I'm not gonna tell you it's the best burger I've ever had, but it's a very good burger. It is very good. And their bill was like fifty five dollars. And it, and that's a proper sit down restaurant. Yep. You know? And they were just like this was like ten times better than Johnny fucking Rockets. And, you know, we actually sat down instead of going to, like, a mall food court. Like, what the heck is going on? And this was, like, a year and a half, two years ago. And I just – I've seen just stuff that kind of, like I said, just, just get more and more expensive. But there's still there's still, there's still still a, a couple of, you know, hidden gems and stuff out there. But um, it, it's You've getting harder really and harder. you really got to work to find them, and it's a shame. Caesars does have the Bacchanal Buffet. But that family of resort properties has closed down some really good buffets over the years. They sold off the Rio about, I would say, six to eight years ago. The Rio Seafood Buffet was one of the best buffets in Vegas. And that's something that I know my dad misses very much. Uh, the Flamingo Buffet about 10 years ago was one of the best buffets in town. It started going downhill they closed it even before COVID and haven't reopened anything in that spot. The Flamingo has also gotten rid of several other amenities, including, of course, the sports book, which we've already discussed on here. The other one that I really liked and was really, really sad to see go downhill was the buffet at Paris. Paris used to have an absolutely excellent buffet. Even though the selection wasn't all that wide, everything they served was great. And then it started going downhill in the late 2010s. And then when COVID hit, they just decided not to reopen it. And that's a shame because Vegas used to be an outstanding buffet town. And now it's 
it, even the buffets are usually pretty overpriced and that's a shame yeah yeah it's it's tough um but uh but yeah i'm you know i'm i'm happy you guys are going to be orleans again this year right Yep, that's us, Orleans, and I am very curious as to what sort of nonsense is going to happen that's tournament-related uh, over the course of the next couple of days, because we're on a several-year streak of the bye-bye Coach K guy and the let-him-shoot-it guy, both of which worked out in my favor. And when that happens, sometimes you just know and you sit back, relax, and roll with it. It's uh, I, I'll be linking to both of those stories uh, over the next couple of days on my Twitter feed. It's th that's the fun of March Madness, where there are so many games going on and you wind up with hundreds of characters just going into and out of the sports book, all wearing different clothes for different teams. You wind up seeing the same people at different spots around a property saying, Oh, Hey, great game yesterday. Or, Oh, Hey, sorry about yesterday. That sort of stuff. You wind up striking up that kind of rapport. And that's the thing that keeps us coming back to Las Vegas, even though there are alternatives that have sprung up and there are other ways in which you could spend your March madness with regard to where you bet from. Obviously in California, I cannot legally bet on sports, but I could just as easily go to New York and do that from the comfort of my dad's living room. But we go to Vegas because of all of the auxiliary stuff that's going on that still makes it fun. And hopefully that's the one thing Vegas won't mess with. Yeah. You know, it, it's funny because, um, you know, I, I obviously I, I like a gamble. I mean, I, I play horses, you know, I, I, I like playing video poker. I like playing slots. I like playing bubble craps, um, you know. And people ask me, right, because they, they know I was, I'd go to Vegas four times, four, three, four times a year. And they'd be like, oh, well, like how often do you go to Rivers, right? And Rivers is obviously the, the casino uh, by the O'Hare Airport. That's the, it's kind of the, it's, it's the, big, it's the biggest slash nicest casino in the Chicago area, uh, while the other two big ones are getting built right now. I was um, going to say, yeah, Bally Chicago is going to be a really big deal. Yeah, Valley Chicago, and then American Place uh, is going to be American Place. Uh, when talking to um, talking to some people, they they're going to build a sports book that's going to be kind of like a mini circa. So it's going to be interesting to see how how Stadium that kind of swim might be pretty tough to pull off. <laughs> I don't think they're going to do that, but uh, they're going to do like the, the 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 stadium seating for the sports book and stuff gotcha. like that. But. Um, like, you know, people ask, like, oh, well, how often do you go, like, to the casino? Or, I mean, here, uh, quite frankly, every single bar is allowed to have, I think, four or five video terminals, right? Which are And also everybody's got their phones, too. Yeah, yeah. But they're like, hey, like, so, like, and I've literally played, like, my my brother uh, asked me, he's like, oh, like, do you ever play at the bars? I'm like, no. Uh, I, I did once, like, we went to, to my uh, sister-in-law, my sister-in-law's family owns a, a bar and and. We were there for a family party, and I put a, I put a twenty into a you know a slot machine they had there. But other than that, like you know, I don't you know I, I don't go to the casino here. Like I go I if I go to gamble, like every dollar I spend gambling outside of Vegas, casino gambling, um, I'm like I could have saved this money for Vegas. Uh, and and but part of the allure is you know for at least for me and my wife is is the other stuff, the spas, the, the restaurants, the walkability. Like I, I understand like places like New York, downtown Chicago. You know, like you can get into areas where you can walk to all kinds of stuff, and and everything's great, or take public transport, or whatever. But there, I just that the resort, the corridor where you can just walk from resort to resort to resort, and just get a completely different experience, completely different restaurant, completely different bars, all that. Um, I mean, it's it's hard to replicate anywhere else. Not to mention open container. So you can do all I can do all that carrying around a white claw or, or a beer or a cocktail or whatever uh, I'm drinking that day. Just and, don't you dare stop on those bridges and elevated walkways because they'll get you. Oh goodness, yeah, that's a good old F one. The, the uh, workaround to that that people thought of just as a gigantic middle finger to the authorities was genius. Yeah, they could stop you from standing in certain spots. What they couldn't stop you from doing 
was taking the escalators up and down and up and down and up and down. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, and, and what, what's funny about that is, I guess, I guess that that is kind of an issue that they've had at other um, other uh, street tracks. Um, but I don't know. It, it just it just felt really weird with that happening in Vegas. But you know, year two, we'll we'll see if they figure it out there. Um, They've I, got I did, a lot of things they need to figure out. I'll tell you that they they fixed the pricing, or I don't say they fixed it one hundred percent, but the pricing came down. So that's a start. Um, but I don't know. It's interesting. Uh, if, if you, if you, if you're interested in this stuff, um, there's, um, there's like earnings calls that you can listen to from Caesars, from MGM, and they'll talk about the impact they had. They'll, and they'll talk about where they missed and stuff. And I remember, um, there's a podcast I listened to called Crap Vegas. Um, and every once in a while they'll do, uh, they'll do a episode on one of the earnings calls. And they did one recently and they were talking about F1 and its impact and um, what they really, I mean, surprise, they're like, our, our high-end properties knocked it out of the park. And then they were like, our middle to lower end did not see the same increase and in fact suffered. And it's like, no shit. <laughs> you know? Like, um, when... I originally was, I, I was playing with the idea of going, but I was like, may, maybe if I can get a comp room somewhere cheap and can get the cheapest ticket, which is $500, right? Granted, it's a three, I'd say a three or four day ticket, right? So it's not just one day. It includes non-alcoholic drinks and food, right? So, okay, I, we we can average it out to a hundred dollars a day in ticket and you know whatever the rest in food right the two hundred dollars in food over three days for Vegas pricing okay it's a lot of money don't get me wrong but I could stomach that um, but the amount that they wanted for the rooms for even the cheap places was astounding yep and so it, I was like well I'm definitely not coming. And then once the cheap tickets sold out instantly, I was like, well, yeah, I'm not going to pay double the price for that ticket and pay this crazy amount only for them to just completely discount the rooms because they realized, oh, yeah, the Luxor is empty, <laughs> you know? And it's like, yeah, I I might have gone last year if I could have gotten my comp room and, and paid for paid for the, um, gotten the, the cheapest ticket. But then again, like, Am I the person they want going? Right, you know. I, I don't know. That it's 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 tough to say, right? But um, yeah, we'll see if they figure it out. Um, and I mean, I know you've talked about kind of. I don't want to say the commercialization because March Madness has always been commercial, right? They got that stupid song that everyone is all happy to hear. They got you know. Hang the, on. The brackets. Hold on. Hold on. Hold everything, Josh. I know you hate anything that leaves people feeling all warm and fuzzy. I understand that's the gimmick. But are you seriously bashing one shining moment? I don't know if I've heard the song. Joshua. Oh, God. All right. I'm going to need you to listen to this song for next week's show. And I want a review. I want an experiential review of listening to one shining moment, because if you can't get the chills from listening to one shining moment while envisioning the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat, you have no heart, you have no soul. Ugh, it, my, my goodness. But yeah, you mentioned the commercialization of March Madness, and there's no better indicator than the NCAA, which has shunned any and all forms of gambling for decades, all of a sudden deciding, yeah, let's do a final four in Vegas. <laughs> like, you, you know, there are going to be stories of low level college basketball staffers who are in town networking because the final four is a gigantic networking thing for a whole bunch of coaches. You know, there are going to be stories of low level staffers that misbehave and wind up getting blackballed from the industry. It's going to happen. Um, but yeah, 
It, with Vegas, you mentioned something, and it sort of hits on an issue in both Vegas travel and horse racing is, are we the customers they want? They being the people in charge that count the beans. And that's a valid question. It's it, it's one of those instances where the Vegas experience has certainly changed. I wrote about this for Winners and Winers, talking about how, yeah, you're going to need to pay for a seat somewhere if you want a spot somewhere on the Strip to watch the games. If you don't want to pay for a seat, those experiences are still available, but you've got to look a little bit harder to find them. And that's Vegas in a nutshell right now. If you want the experiences that were there pre-COVID, they're still out there, but you've got to really work to find them and they're going to be in different locations than maybe you would want to look. And that's no knock on places like the Orleans or like Palace Station. But if you go to Vegas and you say you're staying somewhere off the strip, there is an implied sense of, oh, like if you're an out of town or going to Vegas, the insinuation is you're going to be somewhere on the Vegas Strip. You're not going to stay at an off-strip casino unless it's for a specific reason. And in my case, yep. this is the specific reason. Yeah, and and you know we've um, my wife and I we've gone downtown quite a bit. Um, Downtown's fun. It's fun. Uh, I I I do like the I do like the lower limits. Um, I love Circa. Too. I love Circa, but I'll tell you. You know, some of those other places, I don't know. You know, everyone always says, talks about the gambling being, being much better. And for table games, maybe, maybe that's the case, right? I'm not a huge table game player. I'll play five, I'll play three card poker. Uh, I'll play, um, I, I've played blackjack once or twice, but I just wasn't, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not a huge, huge fan. Uh, three card poker is probably the table game I've played the most, um, I'll play. I'll, I I would love to play craps, but I would not like to play fifteen dollar craps. Uh, so I stick to the bubble craps because it's five dollars. But um, you know, we just I don't know. We've and it could just be small sample size, right? Not you know we're, we're there for hours versus days at, at at the strip properties, but like we haven't seen the difference in in. Uh, you know the amount of money won, or or how long it takes us to lose our money downtown, or anything. But, um, but I, I think you uh, over the years, I think that the gap has has started to shrink a little bit. Uh, where where even downtown, I think is starting to to creep up. But I don't know. Um, this is probably going to be the first year that maybe I only get one trip in. Um, and and even then, like right now. I don't know when that trip's going to be. Like I don't, I don't have it planned. I the, it's been probably about, it's been since the pandemic, uh, that I've not had a Vegas trip planned at some point, uh, and whether whether that's just me personally feeling the squeeze, like like a lot of people are right now, uh, whether it's, um, the 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 value not being there anymore. I mean, my comps have gotten or have stayed the same. They're okay. But, um, I, I don't know. It just, it just feels like, like everything is just, you know, it, it it's not just Vegas, right? Everything's getting, exp getting more expensive. And, you know, we, we don't want to get into, uh, into political territory here. You uh, can too find much. political podcasts elsewhere. People. Yeah. Um, but, but, uh, but yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. It's going to be fascinating. I think, Whenever California legalizes sports betting, when California legalizes sports betting, a lot of the Californians may not have as much reason to go to Las Vegas for events like March Madness, for events like the Super Bowl, for big, big time games and big time weekends. People stay home. People will bet on these things. That's going to wind up being fascinating. It's a couple of years away at the very least. It's probably not going to happen until at least 2026, maybe 2028. But it, that's going to be fascinating. One quick recommendation that I do want to give out before we go away from the Vegas section of our show. Josh, I don't know if I've given this show out on this platform. Have you ever heard of a Netflix show called Obliterated? No. Okay. Josh. 
you're going to love this show. And I hope that those people out there that are looking for a binge show, watch this because they will absolutely love it. The preface of this show, and I will try not to give too much away, but you need to understand a certain aspect of it. There is a team of U.S. special forces that are undercover in Las Vegas trying to stop a nuclear bomb from being sold. They get there. They, you see them partying at the Cromwell on the rooftop, mm-hmm. which is really cool. Um, they find the nuke. They disarm the nuke. Hooray! Everybody's happy. Everybody's safe. We all live. The people on the special ops team make a number of horrible partying decisions that <laughs> night. And at about two or three in the morning, someone calls the team leader and says, we've got a problem. The bomb you guys found was a dupe. The real nuke is still out there and you need to find it. (laughs) It's eight episodes. They're all great. It's very vulgar. It's very profane. It is not for kids. But if you liked The Hangover and you want The Hangover mixed in with movies like The Losers, which was a great movie with Zoe Saldana and Jeffrey Dean Morgan from a while back, mixed with The A-Team a little bit, you will love this show. It's eight episodes. They unfortunately cancel it after one season, largely due to the writer's strike. It's great. It's absolutely fantastic. And it is well worth your time if you're a Vegas enthusiast or just like really funny over the top comedy. It's good stuff. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to check it out. Um, I know my wife and I always, always like finding, uh, finding shows to watch. So we'll, uh, We'll take a look. It's a fun watch, man. <laughs> what uh, what else you got going on? So that's Vegas. Sure. So this week I'm working on the Pollock Reports Derby Bubble, and we're doing things a little bit differently because there were no Kentucky Derby preps this past weekend. So any list that I run would be pretty much the same, 1 through 20, with no updates. So we're doing something we've done the last couple of years where – I compare horses to Derby hopefuls from seasons past. Uh, Sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it's pretty hard. But either way, it makes for a pretty fun read to pass the time between weekends that don't have a ton of Derby preps. Speaking of Derby preps, though, Josh, the Louisiana Derby is coming up on Saturday. Kudos to our friends at the fairgrounds who get it. They drew the race one week in advance. (laughs) Can we get the applause button for Joe Christofek, for John Dooley, for everybody down there who did things the right way? Thank you. Thank you very much. And I got to tell you, Josh, I think this is an absolutely fantastic betting race. You've got a field of 12 horses. Track Phantom is your three to one morning line favorite, but I don't think he's unbeatable by any stretch, not least of which because He's way, way, way outside in that field of 12. Yeah. Um, as I, I pull up this race, because I have not looked at it yet. Um, oh, okay. All right. Let me let me take a look here. Okay. So I got the DRF pass performances. I did not get the Briz uh, pass performances. So I don't have access to whoever the E8 horse is that you're going to put three cherries by and say you have a single. <laughs> if you'd like, I can give you some time because there actually is a horse I like in here at a bit of a price. Oh, here I got, uh, I got it pulled up here. Okay, good. I'm very happy that at least one of us came prepared. So Josh, we got a mile and three sixteenths. You're not seeing things. It's a peculiar distance. I love that peculiar distance. There's a horse in here. I like a fair bit. Can you do me a favor and scroll down to horse number seven Honor Marie? Thank you very much. Honor Marie, last time out, came off a bit of a layoff, ran on the Risen Star, was 7-1, to one, and didn't make up a lot of ground. Having said that, I think there are a number of reasons to draw a line through that race, or at a minimum, think that maybe this horse is sitting on a much improved effort second off the bench. For one, first start since November 25th. Horse might have needed a race. For another, very sloppy racetrack. That track was an absolute bog. He was way back, took a lot of dirt. And also, if you look at those fractions, they went pretty slow up front. 
I don't want to say it was crawling because you have horses going a mile and an eighth in February as three-year-olds. They're going to go a little bit slower just because jockeys, trainers, and even sometimes horses alike don't really know which horses want to go a mile and an eighth and which ones don't. Having said that, this horse did not get the pace set up it wanted. Last time out in the Risen Star, still ran on a bit late to finish fifth that day. Gets a rider switch that I find pretty interesting. Honor Marie, though, is a horse that showed enough talent as a two-year-old to win the Kentucky Jockey Club over a pretty decent field. He's eight to one on the morning line. I think he's going to get a little bit more pace. I think he's going to love the added distance. And I think he's going to improve second off the bench. You're telling me that horse is going to be eight to one in a big field? Sign me up for some of Honor Marie at that price. Yeah, it's interesting, right? Because so uh, obviously the the Risen Star uh, Track Phantom uh, r- r- was in that race, finished second uh, to a uh, I don't know, horse I didn't really give much uh, much credence to. I, I don't think Sierra Leone, or or at least not as much as. Um, as other people did, uh, I think maybe maybe I did have uh, have it as a use, and, and I think I was a, a bit against Track Phantom uh, in that race. But you know, finished second by by a half length in that race. Um, you know, the I think the the steam horse in that race was obviously Hall of Fame, who who didn't really uh, do much running. Loved him that day. I don't hate him in this spot solely because. If you bet him at four to five two back and you bet him at seven to two in the risen star over that sloppy track, you're probably gonna have him on your ticket somewhere at eight to one. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. It, it it'll be interesting to see um how short uh track phantom goes up goes off. Um, you know, like you said, it is out in the parking lot. Um, you know. The rail tends to be pretty good, but um, Brisnet stats shows show the outside post actually being uh, being decent um, uh, routing on the dirt as well. So, um, look looks to be. I mean, he is the E eight. You got an E six in Antiquarian also in this race, but um, you know, I, I don't know. But I got got it pretty easy last time out. I mean, do you give an excuse for not taking the not taking the slop? I mean, has got two second places in the slop. Hasn't necessarily run badly. Um, is a quality road with into mischief on the bottom, and so takes to uh, to mud perfectly fine uh, with with that pedigree. So I, I don't know. I, I don't know if you excuse just just didn't like the 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 sloppy going uh, and. Um, you know, maybe maybe he's able to go there, uh, go out and win uh, wire to wire. But I don't know. The, the post kind of scares me a little bit. Kind of got stuck in the parking lot last time out as well. Um, but I don't know. Pace wise, I, I feel like it, it's going to be a little. Uh, it's going to be a little tough. I mean, maybe you can take a look at someone like the five catching freedom who ran third in that paceless race, but. Is going to get basically the same pace set up in this spot as well, you know. And, and I think that catching freedom uh, probably needs. I don't think it needs a complete meltdown in front, but I mean, if they're if they're going forty nine to the half, they're going forty eight to the half. I don't think catching freedom is going to have a chance. Um, the thing with catching freedom that I am not crazy about. Look at those running lines in the comments. First time out, tight. Second mm-hmm. time out stymied third time out steered four wide last time out tight this horse finds trouble and in a 12 horse field he might well find a lot of it flavian pratt signs on i think that's a very good thing but sometimes some very talented horses find their ways into trouble and i think that might be a learned behavior for that horse who at his best could win this race, but do you really want to take nine to two, five to one on that horse when you can find double the price on graded stakes winners elsewhere in the field? The other two horses, Josh, that I'm looking at in this particular race, both come from the Kenny McPeak barn. I've said it on this show time and time again. I don't get Ken McPeak 
When I use him, they don't run. When I don't use them, they boom me, usually at very big prices. Common defense comes in after having run second behind Timberlake in the Rebel. I thought Brian Hernandez rode a picture-perfect race that day to give common defense every chance. He got through on the rail, had every single chance to run with Timberlake, and just wasn't quite good enough to do it. Common defense makes a little bit of sense, but Josh, draw a line through the Risen Star with number nine real men violin and tell me what you have. Uh, You have a horse that looks like he's been improving every single start. And you have a horse that does have some tactical speed, which I think is going to help him. You also have a horse, Josh, that three starts ago defeated Track Phantom going a mile at Churchill Downs. That I don't think you want to sleep on. And I think Real Men Violin is a very intriguing price play given the odds he's likely to go off at. Maybe this is a horse that peaked as a two-year-old, but I'm more inclined to think that he needed the Risen Star, did not appreciate the bog, did not appreciate the pace setup. He was pretty far back that day. I think he's going to be a little bit closer in this particular race. I think he's going to be sitting two or three lengths off of the early speed, and that's a pretty darn good trip for a horse that is bred to want a lot of distance. He's out of a tap at mare, folks, and you're going to be getting a very square price on this runner, one that, by the way, has been working exceptionally well. That last work, March 16th at Fairgrounds, five furlongs in 59 and three. That's the third fastest of 42 works at the distance that day. I think he's in really good form. And if he repeats the race he ran in the Kentucky Jockey Club when he was two lengths behind Honor Marie, who ran very well, I think he could sneak up and get a big piece of this. Yeah, the the frankly, when I look at these two horses, I think they're running in the wrong derby prep. They Which should be they think should be running in the one that's uh that's being run in Kentucky. Really? You think I so? see yeah, Mendelssohn uh Mendelssohn's uh progeny have really taken to the uh the synthetic uh to start his uh his early uh breeding career. And uh I think Caraconti I mean, honestly, common defense looks like a turf horse. Yeah, Caraconti um, on top out of a street crime mare. There's a lot of turf there. Yeah, so I, I don't know. It's it's interesting that that they show up here, um, but yeah, I, I didn't I didn't really give either of those a look. Honestly, the horse that I'm probably most interested in, and I don't have morning lines up, so uh, Andrew, I'm sure you can tell me. Um, I see a lightly raced Todd Pletcher horse drawn inside uh, Antiquarian, the three horse here. Um, and, and I'm interested to see what kind of price you get on this horse. Um, looks to be on the Brisnet uh, scale, at least a little slow, I think for, uh, for what is needed to run to win this race, but you're getting your inside drawn speed, right? Is in the three post versus the 11 post. Um, and you're getting the horse that's got to run over this surface, uh, albeit it was, uh, it was sloppy, but has a win there going, you know, basically wire to wire. Um, so, and, and if you look at the horse's two starts, you see a lot of italics. Obviously, uh, Conquest Warrior came out to win uh, next time out after his Gulfstream um, debut. And then, uh, oh man, I forget who the second place finisher in that other race is. But you see another set of italics uh, there in the maiden race that Antiquarian just won. So, coming out of back-to-back -back key races... Um, uh, I don't know. I, I think maybe those two races, although they look slow and Briz, maybe a little bit stronger than, than they look. Um, and you get inside drawn speed, which I think is never bad at fairground. So um, you got you got a morning line price on that horse, uh, Andrew? Yes, I do. According to the morning line, Antiquarian is 12 to 1. I think he's going to come down a little bit just because of the Pletcher Velasquez factor. I think he's going to be 8 to 1, 10 to 1. I think you're going to get a couple of ticks down from that, but still, very playable price if you like that horse. Track Phantom is your 3 to 1 morning line favorite. Catching Freedom, 4 to 1. 
Common Defense, six to one. Several horses at eight to one. Bunch of horses in double digits. Real Men Violin, Josh, 20 to one on the morning line. That seems like a massive overlay for a horse that I think has a big shot. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do appreciate that uh, that Fairgrounds draws so early. Um Especially like you know, if, if you if you you're somebody who likes to handicap multiple days in advance, Mr. Mark Capitan. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think it's Louisiana Derby Day is always a, a fun day. It's always a, a big day. You get some good turf racing. You get some good uh, dirt racing. I believe it's uh, closing weekend also for the fairgrounds. Yes, uh, it so is. So they'll, they'll run Sunday. But um, yeah, it's all it's always great. I, I told Caleb that. We would do uh, that. We should do it one year um, for uh, uh, since you know he lives. He's local, but um, we'll we'll see if that. We'll see you if know that what you should year. do. And my dad and I actually did think about this before the pandemic. This was a trip that we thought about. If you fly into Houston, you do Sam Houston. You take the trip, rent a car, you go across the Texas Louisiana border, you hit Delta Downs. Stay overnight somewhere, then go to fairgrounds the next day, and you wind up hitting three tracks in three days. <laughs> and that's going to be the only chance you're going to have to wager on Sam Houston because ain't nobody outside the state of Texas going to be able to wager on them anytime soon. Yeah, and we've uh, we've I think we've beat that one to uh, to death, a la Lord Miles. So no, we will never beat <laughs> Lord Miles to death. Uh, anything else, Andrew? You wanted to talk about today? Um, just some obligatory stuff. Uh, March Madness is coming up. I'm going to say something that's probably going to be very unpopular, but screw it. You don't have to bet every game. You don't have to play 10 or 12 or 15 leg parlays. Be smart. Take principled stands. Put your money where you have your strongest opinions and you'll be rewarded for it. Provided, of course, your opinions are of sound mind and sound logic. That's a winning strategy. Constantly firing at the board where it's sensory overload and there are games going on all over the place. Not a winning strategy. Be smart if you're playing, people. Life's too short to bet the under. To be fair, unders have done really, really well. This is not, uh, please, this is not uh, investment advice. Uh, I, we, we need a disclaimer or something like that. <laughs> yes, uh, we I, do. I do not, I do not, I am not, a, I am. 100% purely recreational uh sports better. I've actually I actually am I'm trying to get better. Um I and I'm trying to uh you know spend more time uh, thinking through bets. I I've talked to a couple of friends who are are semi successful or at least have more experience doing it than I do what they look at like how how do they they kind of um you know structure their bets and things like that. So I'm trying to be a little bit more serious unless, you know, nobody, uh, nobody, uh, you know, life's too short to bet the under. Uh, but, uh, I will say that nothing, no sports bet has been as successful for me as the meme bet. Uh, and, uh, I, I think, I think I've told you, I don't know if I've told you the story before. Andrew. This sounds like a kicker. Oh man. No, it wasn't the kicker. No, I, I, I kick her like a go home thing. Something oh. we had a podcast with, send everybody home happy. So uh, my buddy uh, Greg, uh, aka Murphy, uh, you'll you'll see you've seen his video to close out most of our streams, jumping up and down, yelling twelve for his uh, his horse getting home uh, at uh, the BC. Just but, FYI, yeah, yeah. He um, he's a Chargers fan. I'm sorry. And lifelong Chargers fan, and the the not last year, but the year before, uh, they had the Jags in the playoffs, and I loved the Jags money line. I had a pre, I had probably for me, probably what amounts to about a I four this game, a four or five unit bet on the Jags money line. Oh dear. And the Jags go down 7-0. And I'm like, all right, whatever, it's fine. They go down 14-0. And I see that live money line go up. And I see Greg in our private chat just banging the Chargers drum. 
So I live bet the Jags at uh, 14 0. I then live bet the Jags at 21 0. I then live bet the Jags at 28 0. And I don't remember if they went down even more than that or, or if that's where the bleeding stopped. But I just remember that there was one additional score above and I stopped betting because I was like, all right, this is just this is just too much. But lo and behold, Jags pull that game off and I posted all of the winning tickets with the progressive just money line number going up and up and up and it sent Greg to the moon seeing Ooh. just the <laughs> just these bets and uh yeah to to this day I it was probably it, it was the most I've ever won on a like on a sing, on a non parlayed bet like on just a single um single bet I I mean it, it amounted I think to like 200 bucks total but cuz like I think I had like I had either twenty five or fifty to win on the Jags straight up, and it was probably like plus one ten or plus one twenty, right? It wasn't anything, but I want to say the last the last I got him at was like plus five fifty or plus six hundred or something yep. like that, like, and um, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, he was just like you have no idea how upset I was when I kept on seeing you continue to live bet. And then they the Chargers ended up charging charging that game. Yeah. Yes. And yes, folks, charging is a verb. Uh, I can say that because they poached the head coach of my preferred college football team, the University of Michigan, the national champions, the University of Michigan. Just saying that you need the Michigan fight song on your uh, soundboard there. Oh no, God, no. Yeah. So we're, so we're it was a college football show at some point. Yeah, I bet them at 10-0, 17-0, and then 24-0. And then they went down 27-0, and I was like, I remember I had it enough. was 27-0 before a whole bunch of weird shit started happening, yeah. And I was like, I had enough. They had a uh, 95% chance of winning. Uh, no, yes. 98, no, 98.5% chance of winning. Yeah, the, um, the old uh, ESPN probability chart there, yeah. I'm going to try to find my improbable... Uh, yeah. Oh, I just found it. Oh my, it pops right up. So way, way back in 2021, and some of you out there have heard this story, but way back in 2021, I was in Vegas for Thanksgiving weekend and there were a number of college basketball tournaments going on in front of about 50 people, but there were a lot of games and I went for the most obscure game I could think of. I found the Portland Pilots on the road taking on the Incarnate Word Cardinals. Incarnate Word came in 0-6. Portland was 6-2. Portland was favored by either 6 or 7 points. And at the half, Portland was up 37-31. The second half, weird things start happening. At the under 12, Incarnate Word is up 51-39. I'm giving six or seven points, and this was a fairly big bet for me. Well, all of a sudden, Incarnate Word up 56-44 with 9.43 to go in the game. Does not score for five minutes. Portland retakes the lead, winds up winning 77-68. The win probability chart from that game is, it's like the reverse St. Louis arch. You go here, <laughs> a whoosh, a whoosh. And not only does Portland rally to win, they rallied to cover. It's not quite as good as the NCAA stories that I've got, but considering that that game was not on any television, and my only updates I was getting were coming from screaming into my phone, Portland basketball score. And Siri showing me the Portland Trailblazers as opposed to the Portland Pilots. I, I got pretty stressed out about that one. But that just goes to show you, you know, you can wind up finding things and making really nice scores and having these stories that last a very long time. Not all stories are bad beat stories, kids. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, it was a bad beat story for my friend uh, Greg, but well, uh, I came him. out on top. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he but, got all of that back on just FYI anyway. He just needed, yeah. to, needed to wait a little bit. Yeah. No one's going to cry over, uh, over, uh, over Greg. So, except but, maybe Greg. Yeah, maybe. But uh, yeah, that's going to do it for us. Obviously, on the wrong lead dot com at wrong underscore lead i am at cherry drink andrew's at drink andrew champagne obviously you can check all of andrew's stuff uh there at andrew champagne andrewchampagne.com and uh winners and winers.com he'll be uh someone gave him another twitter and instagram account YouTube. god help us YouTube. all someone let him shoot it Bang. and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna regret it but uh Good luck in good luck in Vegas, Andrew. I'll talk Thank to you later. You. I man. appreciate that, and uh, who knows? Maybe I'll see some people from the NHC who haven't been able to fly out yet. <laughs> All right, have a good one, guys.